after the two previous speakers, I was actually sitting there asking myself, so what now? Because most of the information had <laughs> already been provided. This is supposed to be an overview paper to set the scene, um, but let me just do what I needed to do, and hopefully I can skip some of the things that have been said already by the previous speakers. So, before I go to the main presentation, I just wanted to showcase the Namibia that we live in first. I hope the pictures are clear, maybe not. But what I was hoping to get from showcasing this picture was to say, all of us, when we look at this, I think we, what we see is, what we should be seeing is the divide between urban and rural developments in Namibia, and rural areas in Namibia. Hopefully, as, as we go, um, and as I present, some of those um, things are going to come out. We have a vision to become an industrialized, developed economy by 2030, and it is so close. This is 2023. Maybe we can argue it is achievable, but Will we all feel what we are going to achieve by 2030? Is it going to be a matter of, yes, we are a developed economy, but there are certain people that feel left out and that do not feel the development um, stage that we have achieved. I guess our being here today is to ensure that we minimize the situation where others are going to feel left out by 2030. So, um, as I said, I'm also to set the scene by providing an overview on the current situation in Namibia. When it comes to the subject matter of rural development um, or rural economic development in Namibia, um, as such, I will provide a brief introduction, just for context purposes, but the two previous speak speakers have already touched on that. I will then look at some policy um, related to rural policy um, development. We will then look at some activities um, that are prevalent or activities that are taking place in the rural economy or in the different um, regions, the rural areas. We will look at a case of South Korea um, just for lessons and then we will provide um, some recommendations in terms of what we think should happen. Um, on policy. So, we have a huge country um, geographically, but we also have a small population. And I think the minister has alluded to the fact, or either the minister or the governor has alluded to the fact that some of the challenges that we are experiencing because of the fact that we have a huge country and we are sparsely, um, is it sparsely populated? What it then uh, causes is that it becomes difficult for us to extend services. Um, that probably also then adds or have added to the underdevelopment of the rural areas, such that what we are seeing today in rural areas is that they are underdeveloped, there is high rate of unemployment, but also then the poverty is high in rural areas. The agriculture sector seems to be the main um, activity 
or the main sector that plays a role in the development of um, not only the rural areas but also the Namibia at large. So let's look at um, the policy framework that we have related to rural development. Namibia has implemented quite a number of policies aimed at addressing rural challenges and these policies continue to evolve. For instance, if we look at Vision 2030, Vision 2030, um, through Vision 2030, the country actually um, aspires to build a knowledge-based industrialized economy by 2030. It's an ambitious goal, um, as I indicated earlier. But part of it is also focused on rural development. In fact, the NDPs, which are the implementing tool of the Vision 2030, most of them had a theme of rural development and poverty um, alleviation. We also have um, decentralization policy. As we know, decentralization policy was aimed at bringing services closer to communities, but also then to ensure community participation in matters affecting them, also related to economic development matters in rural areas. Um, however, I think where we are, we can agree that the decentralization uh, that we envisage to have by now, we may not have achieved, at least not to the extent that was desired. Then we have the National Rural Development Policy and Strategy. As I said, these are evolving. I think the latest one that we had was uh, for, for 2012. It was developed in 2012. Uh, it's being reviewed now. And our hope is that as we go about reviewing what is happening currently in Namibia, that some of those things will then see themselves through the policy and the strategy for rural development that we are going to develop. Um, so, we have looked at what has happened so far. Also in terms of policies, what is it that we are seeing? We think there is actually a need for us to enhance the effectiveness of some of the provisions that we have in the rural development policies. For instance, the issue of coordination. Many stakeholders are involved. Many stakeholders are involved in um, rural development activities. Excuse me. So many stakeholders are involved. What we have seen so far is there hasn't been clear coordination between these stakeholders. And when you have people operating in silos, it actually causes issues. So then, what we also then have seen is that in the rural development policy and rural development strategy, the current one that we have that are being reviewed, um, we may not have looked at region-specific challenges. So we have taken an approach of one size fits all. But as we know, regions are heterogeneous. So there is no one size fits all. So hopefully we can take that on. And then what we also think should happen is we need to incorporate um, region-specific analysis into the design of the new policy and strategy that we are reviewing now. And there is also a case for us to 
have a consistent story in terms of identifying the main constraints, not in rural areas as a whole. We need to look at specific regions and say, in this specific region, these are the constraints, otherwise we are going to miss it. And then we need also then to incorporate detailed analysis um, of which policy interventions are more suited to decentralized processes and, and, and why. That's on the policy. If we now look at what are some of the activities that we are seeing happening in rural areas. Um, we picked up actually that there are three key activities that are taking place in rural areas. The three are wholesale and retail trade. We know there is a lot of ambassions, a lot of uh, small shops and so on in rural areas. And then we have the agriculture sector. This has been playing a role, not only in rural areas, but also at national level. And then we have the fishing and forestry and accommodation and food um, services. So agriculture, fishing and forestry has always remained a key sector, especially in the rural economy. But also the accommodation and services, uh, food services and beverages is picking up somehow. That's what we have um, realized in the third place. However, most of those um, activities that are taking place in terms of businesses, they are not registered. Uh, registered. About 78% of those businesses are not registered. And that in itself um, says it all in terms of do they then have access to the formal, excuse me, do they have access to formal services and um, support that they need to get. Um, I've spoken about the agricultural sector. The only aspect that I didn't mention is in terms of um, employment, for instance. The main key employment activity or in, in employment creating sector in rural um, areas is actually the agricultural sector and you can see the numbers that we are projecting them. In terms of tourism, of recent we have seen a number of not only accommodation and food services, but also conservancies have become a key tourist activities in rural areas. We have picked up that um, a total of 86 communal conservancies and 42 communal forests are registered by the Ministry of Environment, Forestry and, and Tourism. So one of the main challenges when it comes to conservancies, for instance, in the tourism um, industry in rural areas is that the regional um, Councils, for instance, they are either not involved or they actually don't understand what this whole rural um, tourism um, activity is supposed to, to be. I think there is a case for, for us to do more in terms of involving them so that they are then able to um, maybe encourage communities to engage in more of those activities and so on. Then there's small scale um, mining. This is mostly happening in the Erongo, Kunene, and Karas um, region. So the small scale miners, in our view, is one sector that can also um, create employment in the rural areas and contribute to the development of rural um, areas. The next item that we looked at, aspect that we looked at is infrastructure and accessibility to infrastructure. Because as previous speakers have indicated, infrastructure is actually an enabler to 
economic development. And if economic activities are to take place or happen in rural areas, we need to ensure that there are infrastructures. So we have looked at the aspect of energy, for instance. Um, in terms of energy, we have seen that the access rate currently is estimated at 48%, and that 48% is made up of 73% in urban areas and 21% in rural areas. You can already see the divide there. The one aspect when it comes to energy is cost. It's not always affordable to the rural, uh, rural populations. It's more expensive. And in fact, with the exception of South Africa, if you look at the neighboring countries, Namibia is actually the second highest. Then if you look at um, telecommunications, um, let me just pick up one very fast. If you look at um, telecommunications, for instance, and internet access, Um, I don't know what is happening here now. Okay. Um, my sincerest apology. Something seems to be yeah. happening. But if you look at, I will be continuing as it comes. If you look at um, telecommunications and internet access, for instance, Generally, we have a high coverage, coverage rate in terms of telecommunications. However, the cost aspect is again a challenge, especially when it comes to rural economies or rural populations. They are not able to afford the cost of data, for instance. And we have identified um, three regions where this is mainly an issue in terms of access for instance Kavango West is one and then you have Omaheke and Kuneni especially those um, three regions there is actually an issue when it comes to um, telecommunications and internet access Then we looked at why. Don't, don't, don't press now. Okay. Um, then we looked at length tenure as an aspect as well. Something is not working. Okay, I will be talking. Maybe some, yeah. Then we look at land tenure um, system, for instance, which is also posing a challenge for rural development. Um, access to land plays a big role in economic development, and it is supposed to be an enabler, enabler to access to finance and also in terms of. Um, improving infrastructure by communities themselves. You need land. So the land tenure system currently in Namibia is a constraint in that the rights, land rights that you have, you cannot make use of it as, as collateral, for instance, for you to access um, um, finance. So we are also, in terms of in infrastructure for access to finance, we think maybe th um, things like agent banking, if we can make use of approaches like agent banking to expand financial inclusion by bringing banking services closer to a larger portion of the population. 
I don't think it is. Uh, um, I will, I will go wrong if I were to mention, for instance, that one of the things that we have identified that can assist us in terms of access to finance is actually on the payments front, where we are supposed to be looking at what are some of the systems that we can implement as a country to enhance access to finance, especially in terms of um, payment related um, infrastructure and so on. And I know that it was in the newspapers, for instance, in the media, that the Bank of Namibia has been working on um, trying to develop a system that will um, ensure access to finance through a payment system related um, approach. I think those are some of the things that we are supposed to be um, implementing. Then, in terms of in terms of roads, we said infrastructure are key, and part of the important infrastructure is actually roads, access to roads. So, what we have seen is that. We have identified the issue of earth roads, and that are mainly prevalent in the rural areas. So, if you can look at the highlighted in yellow, for instance, for the fifth consecutive year, um, maybe before I go to the highlighted in yellow, for the fifth consecutive year, Namibia has been identified as the top in terms of the quality of roads. I, I don't know what is happening. Yeah, maybe I should. So it has been identified as top in terms of the quality of roads. However, despite that ranking, um, the quality of roads on a national level has much to be desired, especially in rural areas. So the rural earth roads, that are characterizing the um, rural areas have deficiencies in terms of quality. And because of the quality aspect that is lacking, you make it actually difficult for rural um, economies to access markets, to connect with other areas and so on. So, then we looked at the case of Korea, more especially also in terms of how they have made use of infrastructure to develop uh, rural areas. So, in, in, in South Korea, for instance, there is a project that they call um, South Korea under new village movement, which in fact it was a government uh, government driven project. It was a project driven by a pub, by public sector initially, where they introduced um, infrastructures in rural areas where there was, for instance. Uh, no infrastructures. So they introduced infrastructure and what then happened was that Don't use press. Just don't use it. Then we can control it. Yeah, please. Yeah. Thank you. So if you can go to the case of Korea for me then. It's before that. Just before that. Yes. Please proceed, since you are controlling from that side. It's not working. So, um, the case of Korea, for instance, like I said, the 
public sector embarked upon a program to provide infrastructure in rural areas. So what has then happened is between 1997 and 1993, there was then that program of building and um, upgrading basic infrastructure. Um, then they included, for instance, infrastructures related to paths or roads, upgrading of small stream beds, and then um, water for irrigation, for instance, and, and so on. So infrastructure rehabilitation and income generation was then part of phase one of their project. And then during 1974 uh, to 1976, the focus was then shifted to expanding agricultural output and included activities such as construction um, of roads, alignment to farmlets, and mechanization of agricultural production. Then what the outcome of that around 1977 to 19, uh, 1979, what was realized then was that um, the rural areas was transformed in terms of character um, into things like they, they were transformed into industrialized um, urban areas through a process commonly known as dissemination, and that is really just broadening of the populace that would then embrace the principles that led to the movement um, success. Can you then just press from there again to the policy? So having looked at the current situation in Namibia and having looked at the the lesson from South Korea, for instance, what are some of the policies that uh, we are recommending um, should happen in Namibia? The first one is, we think Namibia should invest in infrastructure development, like road, upgrading, affordable rural cl classification or electrification, and access to financial services. The second that we think we want to recommend is that Namibia as a government and as a nation should um, pro make provision for or promote the use of internet to benefit entrepreneurship activities in rural areas through skills development. Then there is also a case for increasing agricultural productivity by increasing access to feed for livestock. The fourth recommendation is that the government should continue relying on joint work with national universities and other agricultural uh, research centers to expand domestic innovation and access to improved seeds for more crops. <laughs> the fifth one is we need to boost conservancies based uh, conservancy based tourism as a catalyst for rural economic growth through the involvement of local government uh, structures. Then the th six years one is the government needs to reform um, land tenure in the country so that we make it uh, tradable and communities can make use of it as collateral for instance. Then we think there's also a case for um, the rural development centers to be used as a catalyst for rural development to become um, rural technology hubs, for instance. They can become innovation um, hubs, for instance. Then the one in the center, as I highlighted earlier, is that there seem not to be um, coordination, and there is an issue of overlapping of policies, and therefore we probably have to um, then work on that as we review the national rural policy um, and, and, and strategy, and, and also perhaps then introduce 
a rural development act. So I think that is the end of my presentation. I think.